that acknowledgements of country are about acknowledging the diverse groups of people from over 300 nations and over 600 dialects of languages, the world's oldest living culture. It's an expression of respect to the peoples and to God. Brooke also says an acknowledgement of country for her is a prayer, a prayer of thanksgiving to our almighty creator who placed Aboriginal peoples here as his custodians. So today we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Geringer community of Darawal and Durga language groups, the elders and leaders of the local Aboriginal communities are stewards of this land and its waters, as they have been for thousands of years on behalf of our almighty creator. We hear about that in the epic long reading that Paul Gordon's got to read later from Genesis chapter one. This land holds many stories all the ceremonies and celebrations seen and heard and been present to since time immemorial. We acknowledge the four corners of this land, the north, the south, the east and the west. God's wondrous creation, once abundant with life of all creatures and all plants and animals, sufficient for all our human needs, a rich environment. So we pay our respects to the elders and leaders in the past, in the present, and for those to come. I thank the elders for the way in which they refresh, revitalize and maintain culture. It's called Trinity Sunday today. So our opening prayer, I'm asking you to join me just in one line at the end of each section. And hopefully that'll all turn up on the screen. Well, let's pray. Living love, beginning and end, giver of food and drink, clothing and warmth, love and hope, life in all its goodness, we praise and adore you. Jesus, wisdom and word, lover of outcasts, friend of the poor, one of us, yet one with God, crucified and arisen, life in the midst of death, we praise and adore you. Holy Spirit, storm and breath of love, bridge builder, eye opener, waker of the oppressed, unseen and unexpected, untamable energy of life. We praise and adore you. Holy Trinity, forever one, whose nature is community, source of all sharing in whom we love and meet and know our neighbour, life in all its fullness, making all things new. We praise and adore you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's come to God with our prayer of confession. Let's pray. God of infinite mercy, when we neglect the humbleness of knowing our place in this world, forgive us. When we trade your peace and calls for unity, for conflict and violence, forgive us. When we forsake our good character to join those who scoff at your ways, forgive us. When we ignore your truth and turn away from your wisdom, forgive us. 
forgive us and heal us, Lord, that we may abide in your grace and your love forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, God fills our soul with grace and wisdom. It is from this grace that we have hope. It is from this wisdom that we know God's love. It is from the living God that we find life and forgiveness. Thanks be to God. Now, we, we kind of have three readings today, but um, I took pity on Gordon because he's got that very long one in there. And so we're going to say the, the psalm together. And uh, Trinity Sunday, it's a great psalm, Psalm 8. So it's not the whole psalm, but it's drawn on the psalm and a very well-known one. And... Um, as the background, you've got some photos from the James Webb Telescope. That's our, our, our universe, what's kind of out there in the sky, which we don't always see. It's, uh, it's fairly obvious where you join in. I could, I'll go over this side. Oh God, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars. Why do you think of us? Yet you have made us with glory. You have created us with honour and joy. O oh God, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth together. In the wisdom of all ages, you, the Holy One, give us life with honour and glory. We sing praises to you for all the works of wonder around us. Now, Gordon's going to lead us in the reading. Thanks, Gordon. The first reading today from Genesis 1, 1 to 2 and 4. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. Second reading, Matthew 28, 16 to 20, the Great Commission. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountains where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Here is the reading. Thanks be to God. Ah, yes. It's hard to express it, isn't it? I was meant to do the whole chapter there, Gordon. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> People can tell you, you. You can all tell me how does that creation story go? What happens first? Let there be light. That's the first day, isn't it? And then there's a bit of a, I think the land and the sea is next, isn't it? The separating separating of things so that we have land and we have sea and sky yes and at the same time all the vegetation arises from the land 
that actually fits uh, Aboriginal ways of understanding creation too. That that energy and life coming up from the ground like that. And um, then we have, is it more, is it the creatures in the sea and things next? Yeah. And the birds, yes. And the animals. And then we eventually get to down the bottom of the list. Probably appropriate, isn't it? Although we seem to forget it all the time. Human beings, they are made in our image, in God's image, which is a bit hard to grasp, isn't it? <laughs> human beings, all of human beings made in God's image. You get this mix of plural and singular there. But in the Matthew reading, as we heard, there's a nice little very plain piece, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's quite a clear expression of the Trinity, isn't it, in Scripture, which is actually pretty rare uh, to have it so explicit like that. Most of the time in Scripture, you might get talk about the Spirit or talk about God the Father or, or the Creator or the Almighty God and talk about Jesus, obviously. It's rare that it all comes together in one little spot very explicitly. And um, because of that, it took Christians hundreds of years to put it all together into some form of imperfect understanding of God. One of the reasons I've, I, I saw a good question on it, how on earth, we say that fairly regularly, don't we? How on earth? can we picture God? How on earth can we describe God? Well, we can have a go at the sun. At least he becomes incarnate in the man Jesus. But what about the Father and the Holy Spirit? And that is an important part of the Trinity, I think, starting with Jesus. Let's take a step back, though. I wonder when it was that people decided there was something behind the world. Nobody knows for sure, of course. When we decided there was something greater than us. But we do know that people called this something God, or words in other languages like that. And we know they thought there were probably quite a few gods. And everyone thought or hoped that their God was the best God, naturally, or the strongest God. So it makes sense that over time, the worship for our God became increasingly lavish and extravagant. But by the time Jesus was around, Jewish people had come to understand that there is only one God. That's called monotheism, one God. And it's central to our understanding of God. Under the Romans in Jesus' time, most people were poor and oppressed. And poor people often didn't have enough money to buy the right sacrifices or to worship in the temple. And that's why Jesus gets so angry with the money changers when he cleanses the temple. In that story, Jesus said, it's written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. And the text goes on to say, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things that he did and heard the children crying out in the temple, 
see, we're starting to see Jesus do amazing things. And we see that the rulers of the religion were not happy. He was just a man. An upstart from Galilee who needed to be brought under control. There's a song about that which shows the difference between the ways the poor and the rich met Jesus. Anyone want to have a guess of what the song is? I'll give you a clue. It's a pretty big clue. Marcia Hines. Well, anyway, you're going to have to listen to it then, aren't you? Oh, I'm not playing the whole song, just one of the verses. Remember that? It's going back a few years, isn't it? <laughs> 70, early 70s, gosh. What's that, 50 years now? 40. Uh, I even remember it. And I thought I was young. <laughs> but do you like that? I like those words. When it's brought to my attention, I've been changed. Yes, really changed. In these past few days, when I've seen myself, I seem like someone else. I don't know how to take this. I don't see why he moves me. He's a man. He's just a man. He changed people. But he was just a man. And as we heard earlier, he was also a threat to social stability. He was upsetting the system. So he was killed in some kind of collusion between the religious leaders and the Romans. The people loved him. The leaders hated him and were afraid of him. After he was dead, some people were convinced they had seen him again. He was risen from the dead. They would call this the resurrection. And when they tried to describe what he'd been like, what it was like when Jesus was among them in the flesh, they said that when he was with them, God was with them. But it was more than just as if God was with them. It was more than that. We can see this in the reading in Matthew. On the mountain in the place where you worship God, in the mountaintops where you meet God, the disciples worshipped Jesus. Jewish people with monotheism in their bones, one God, can't help but worship this man, Jesus. They don't quite say he is God, but he's clearly not just a man. The word they used to describe him is no longer a part of our experience in the 21st century. He was not God-like, nor was he like God. They said he was God's son. In their culture, when the king's son came, it was like 
when the king came. But it was not the king. But he had all the authority of the king. And if you had seen the son, you had effectively seen the king. The word of the son was the word of his father. And if he told you something, you could say the king himself had told you this. That was a normal way of understanding in their culture. Now, if Jesus was not of a, enough of a challenge for the folk who wanted to keep God safe in heaven and be safe from God, those early Christians also said they were still meeting God in this new way, that they had met God when Jesus was present. God was as close as breathing, as one of our hymns says. The Old Testament used to talk about the spirit of God. In Isaiah, the suffering servant, a lot of Handel's Messiahs on based on that part of Isaiah. The spirit, it says, the spirit of the Lord is now upon me. But it was an experience that had an air of being kind of reserved for the especially chosen people rather than something for you and me. People longed for a time when perhaps God's spirit would be poured out on all flesh. Young men, old men, maid servants. There's a song about that in the prophet Joel. And these early Christians said that's what had happened to them. Even though Jesus was physically gone from them, they still felt God in a new, startling, liberating way. God's spirit had poured out on them. They were noted for being changed people. So 50 and 60 years after the death of Jesus, we can see in the Gospel of Matthew that people were being baptised in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And some folk were saying, hang on, that, that sounds like three gods. It's only meant to be one god. And the Christians were saying something like, yes, there is only one God, but we've met God in these three ways. We can't deny the reality of how God has met us and healed us and loved us and still does. And over another couple of hundred years, people worked out some sort of model or framework to describe this experience, which they called the Trinity or the triune God. And you've heard that. One God, three persons. Only the persons are not persons like you and me. The three persons are distinct, yet are one substance or one essence or one nature. Some say a nature is what one is, whereas a person is who one is. Now, at this point, it's easy to throw your hands up and go, oh, it's, too, it's too much for me. <laughs> much easier just to say, well, I'll just think about God as Jesus. That makes sense to me. I like what Mary Magdalene sang in that musical. As I said, I've been changed, yes, really changed. In these past few days when I've seen myself, I seem like someone else. The song was deep. The writer knew something of what Jesus can do to us. <clears throat> and we might relate to more of the words that Mary sang. There's a little bit more for you.
if he said he loved me, I'd be lost. I'd be frightened. I couldn't cope. Just couldn't cope. Turn my head, I'd back away. I wouldn't want to know. He scares me so. I want him so. I love him so. Doesn't that capture our desire to love God and yet capture our fear of God and our fear of being too close to God so well? But that's just Jesus. And if he were, oh, sorry, if we were to sing that song today, what sense would it make? The song is singing about a man who's alive and present to Mary, but we know he's dead and gone. Except the doctrine of the Trinity says God isn't gone. God is present now. God still loves us. God still moves us. And the doctrine of the Trinity says he's not just a man. He is in some way beyond our logic. God. God's son. In one way, the doctrine of the Trinity is another song. Just like I don't know how to love him. It brings together all our faith's experience of God over millennia. And it points us towards a central experience of God loving us. Or in other words, at the heart of the doctrine of the Trinity is God's being as communion. Is a tricky word. God's unity is not monadic. Have you heard of a monad? Apparently a monad, I had to look it up, is a simple single cell organism. So God's unity is not like that. It's just a simple single thing. God's unity is relational. The doctrine of the Trinity is the church if you like, the church's exegesis of 1 John 4, God is love. Father, Son and Spirit indwell each other in love, giving, receiving and returning love in an eternal dynamic of gift exchange. Father, Son and Spirit are constituted by their mutuality part of who they are they are who they are only in their interrelationships and so two human beings made in God's image we are who we are only in relationship with others Margaret Thatcher said that there's no such thing as a society on the contrary, there's no such thing as an individual. There are only persons in relationship. It's been observed that this image of God doesn't always square with our understanding of personal relationships. We use that phrase. Whether they be relationships with God, personal relationship with God, or personal relationship with each other, often we don't link together the person on one hand and the relationship on the other because in modern western societies when we say personal we usually mean individual without any necessary sense of mutuality or interdependency or inseparability sounds rather lonely and isolated doesn't it There's a lot of that in our society. The whole eternity is not personal in our Western sense at all. The personal nature of God, God's very being, is relatedness. Father, Son and Spirit in the unity of communion. And so in turn for us to have a personal relationship with God is not 
a matter of two separate individuals, creature and creator, becoming pals. It's much deeper than that. It's a matter of being caught up into the very life of God, which is always personal, but never individualistic. The Trinity reminds us that Christianity is not about having a one-to-one -one relationship with the isolated God, nor is it about having a private relationship with God to the exclusion of others. No, from start to finish, Christianity is about participating in the Trinitarian life of God. And it's about participating in the community of the body of Christ, which is the human reflection of God, the tri tri triune God. So clearly the Trinity isn't an irrelevant doctrine. It's actually a very practical, has a lot of practical implications, that God is essentially and eternally God in relationship, a relationship of equality and mutual fellowship. That's a pretty strong critique of hierarchies, of domination, of exclusion of the economics of greed and exploitation. Finally, God that God is Trinity means that God is mystery. But it's not a mystery that we try to be explained, but it's a mystery to be entered. God calls us to participate in his very being. We're invited to step into the frame, the life, the essence of God, to approach the table, to share in the holy communion of Father, Son, and Spirit. For is that not the meaning and purpose of worship, of being a church, of being Christian, to be drawn into to indwell the very life and being of God as we lift up our hearts to the Father through the Son in the Spirit. Yes, it is so. It is certainly so. Amen. As we sang in the last hymn, praise the maker, son and spirit, one God in community, calling Christians to embody oneness and diversity. Thus the world shall yet believe when shown Christ's vibrant unity. So as we think of those words, let us come before God in prayer for others. O oh God, we pray for a broader vision of the needs of humanity and a deeper compassion. To fill those needs for a planting of the seeds of concern for all humanity in our hearts. For a tapping of the wells of generosity. May we live together as people who have been forgiven a great debt. May we be gentle walking softly with one another. May we be understanding, lest we shall add to the world's sorrow or cause to flow needless tears. May be, we be as anxious for the rights of others as we are for our own. May we be as eager to forgive as we are to seek forgiveness. May we know no barriers of creed or race or sex, that our love may be like yours, a love that sees all people as your children and our kin. May we be ministers of humanity and come together as community as we interact with that small community we call our family. With its strengths, 
that nurture or its faults that hurt and inhibit its unity. We ask for a special blessing. That community we call the church universal with its many loves and its numerous failures and even its scandals. We ask for a special blessing. For that community we call our circle of friends, with its times of harmony and mutual joy, and its incidents of misunderstanding or neglect, we ask a special blessing. For that multi-ethnic community called our nation, with virtues that make us proud to be Australian, yet also with its prejudices and hurtful ways, we ask a special blessing. For that teeming community we call the world, rich with achievements for the good of all, yet riven by greed, hatred, intolerance, injustice, arrogance and war, we ask a special blessing. We particularly pray for the Aboriginal communities of this land, Australia, who have invited us to walk with them in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. May we practice deep listening as we interact with these communities. And may we also keep in our prayers the church communities of the North Lake Macquarie and the Hohu Korean community. By your Holy Spirit, incite all people of faith and goodwill to strive untiringly for that communal harmony where the value of no one is denigrated and where the gifts and successes of each person are celebrated with unstinted gratitude and joy. For your name's sake. Amen. Hear the words of institution of this sacrament as recorded by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat and do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it for the remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, according to our Saviour's command, we set this bread and this cup apart for the Holy Supper to which he calls us and invites us. And we come to God with our prayers of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Let us lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right to give our thanks and praise, O God, and to join with the whole world in declaring the greatness of your name. In the beginning, your spirit brooded over the chaos and brought to birth all beauty and abundance of creation. You created humankind in the image of your own faithful love and desire, dressing us in glorious splendor and entrusting the care of the earth into our hands. 
and from our midst you brought forth your own child, Jesus the Christ, one with you and the embodiment of your spirit. And through him you invited all people to be baptised into your triune dance of love. When he was killed, you raised him to life and gave him all the authority in heaven and on earth and in him through the Holy Spirit, you are with us always, even to the end of the age. And so we praise you with the faithful of every time and place, joining with choirs of angels and the whole creation in the eternal hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest. Gracious God, we ask you to bless this bread and this wine that they may be for us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. And that he may ever live in us and we in him. May we be strengthened through your Holy Spirit to be the body of Christ, your servant people, faithful in all things and humble in our service to you and all people. Amen. Let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sin, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The bread we break is a sharing in the broken body of Christ. The cup we take is a sharing in the blood of Christ. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. body of Christ broken for you. blood of Christ given for you. Let us pray. Most gracious God, you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. Now we give ourselves to you and ask that our daily living may be part of the life of your kingdom. May our love be your love, reaching out into the life of the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is the faith that Christians proclaim. The power of God that created the world 
is the power of love, power in Jesus that rescues the world is the power of love. The power in us that changes the world is the power of love. Therefore, I bid you go in the name of love this day and always. Amen.